and uh, change the slides on you. So a little slide change here. And uh, to build on this conversation about resilience, I'm going to invite uh, Ava Jackson, who's the Managing Director of ICLEI Canada, to continue the conversation. Ava? <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Will, and thank you for the invitation. I was just joking to Don that he can uh, take my time, but he can't take my thunder. So I'm going to pick up a lot where a lot where Don left off, which is really to focus in on less the pipes and wires problem of climate change, but really more the people uh, problem and uh, really zero in, zero in on the equity piece. Um, as Will said, my name is Eva Jackson. I'm Managing Director with ICLEI Canada. I'm uh, here from Toronto, which is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Uh, however, we have offices in Montreal, Victoria, and Toronto. I'm going to be brief uh, because we uh, are running a bit off schedule and I want to be mindful and leave plenty of time uh, for our activity uh, after the break. Uh, a tiny bit about ICLEI, we are a local government association. We were established in 1990 uh, and we work with municipalities and their partners uh, on climate action. We do this through events. We do this through programming. Many of you will be familiar with the Partners for Climate Protection Program, which is a joint program of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and ICLEI, as well as our Building Adaptive and Resilient Communities Program, which is what I'll be talking about today. And then we create a variety of tools and resources to support that capacity building. Um, Don touched on this. I don't want to uh, not focus on uh, the transition to low carbon, uh, but I really want to zero in on uh, the adaptation and the resilience piece. And, you know, Rob Westling said it very well. It's really about adaptations, about managing the unavoidable, um, whereas mitigation we see as avoiding the unmanageable. We, we will get to a point where we won't be able to adapt if we continue down uh, the carbon pathway that we're going on right now. And so really thinking about um, both pieces in tandem happening at the same time and where we can multi-solve to get benefits that achieve both a low carbon transition as well as a resilient future. We talked about costs. I won't talk about this. Um, what I did want to talk about, though, is the role of yourselves in communities. And that's whether you are an elected official, you're here with a community organization. There's lots of data that is freely available to tell you how the climate will change. It essentially is going to be hotter wetter when you don't want it to be and wilder uh, we're going to have more extreme weather this is just a profile pulled for uh, the vancouver region here um, but this is just data and it doesn't tell you a picture if you think about a coloring book this draws you an outline right and it's all you folks living in communities understanding who else lives there what is there what draws people to your communities that colors it in and uh, will we'll enable you to create the list of impacts of what this data means. What does it mean to have 100 days in a summer over 25 degrees for Vancouver, or over 30 degrees for Southern Ontario? Who does that impact? What does it impact? Uh, what are the negative consequences of that? What are opportunities arising from that, that if planned for appropriately, uh, can be seized in a changing climate to drive an economic transition? Um, and we're seeing that <clears throat> across the country, excuse me. So what do those changes mean? Uh, this is a region that's no stranger to climate impacts from the atmospheric rivers to heat domes. And this manifests differently. Um, and how it manifests is different if you're an urban community or if you're a rural community. Who is at the end of that road that's been washed out? You know, do they have access to a social network? Do they have people they can turn to locally for help? What is their level of social connection? That's a really important thing to think about um, when we understand climate change is more than a pipes and wires problem. Um, do they have insurance, as Don would argue? Do they have someone they can turn to for help? Do they have access to capital? Um, and th that that is also true in urban contexts. Um, Andrea earlier talked about the uh, Vancouver 
uh, engagement or uh, loneliness strategy, the strategy they produce to fight loneliness. Loneliness and isolation is a huge problem from a climate change perspective. If you can't get to people who are stuck in their apartments, if you don't know that they're having a problem, that is what's going to result in fatalities and deaths and injuries. Um, so understanding that and seeing that as part of a climate change challenge and your role as local authorities in acting on that is a, a big component of understanding all elements of the climate change crisis. Now, motoring along, there's a lot being done by municipalities across the country. I just have a few examples and I've bundled them in terms of types of intervention. So naturally we've talked about infrastructure uh, improvements. <clears throat> the photo here is of a very cute then five-year-old little girl uh, who is standing at a really uh, amazing example of an erosion control that was centered around tourism and at the same time protecting that coast. Um, it is in Per Se, Quebec, which is on the mouth of the St. Lawrence, where the Atlantic Ocean feeds into the St. Lawrence. It is a huge tourist region, uh, and particularly the coastline. It was getting eroded by storm after storm after storm, and they did a massive rehabilitation then with our friends at Uranos uh, to understand how a climate-adjusted future would impact the coastline there and how they could uh, adapt in a way that didn't ruin uh, the experience of visiting that coast with just a giant retaining wall, but really manifested uh, in a solution that multi solved both economic development as well as stormwater uh, control. Uh, the same is happening on uh, with smaller, uh, small scale. Uh, I would say green infrastructure and nature-based solutions. The example here is a, uh, a multi-sector uh, solution with the IMAX, that's the movie people uh, that they have in uh, Mississauga. It was a partnership with the city of Mississauga, the IMAX uh, company, as well as the conservation authority there, which is a watershed planning council. We have them in Ontario, um, where they're putting in pieces of small-scale green infrastructure on private lots uh, that are trying to reduce the stormwater management fees for the private company, while at the same time reducing flood risk by trying to collect that water on site and providing some aesthetic benefits for employees of that company. There's a lot of awareness raising work going on. Um, this was really fascinating work happening in Windsor. And again, an interesting collaboration between Windsor, Essex Public Health, the city of Windsor and um, Health Canada, where they found that their playgrounds were heating up to you know, 40, 45 degrees Celsius, the actual equipment. So they did some thermal mapping and they put up a lot of signs sort of saying, you know, on hot days, you have to be really careful. They put up shade sails. And these are really low cost interventions that are preventing people from getting hurt um, and really vulnerable people, little children um, uh, on site. And again, it's an example of you know, not necessarily the city alone couldn't have done it. The public health information they needed wasn't held by them, but a creative par uh, partnership um, really helped to raise that. And then I talked a little bit about social connectedness <clears throat> and equity. Uh, this is an, just a small example in Lamec, New Brunswick, after uh, some winter storms. This is a really small rural community where they are building uh, community kitchens to help ice stranded seniors living alone, being able to get food and medicine to them um, just with a volunteer run program. We're doing similar work with the city of Beaconsfield, Quebec, where we're doing a social connectedness mapping program. So we've launched a broad community survey to get people to reflect on the strength of their connections with their neighbors. So do they know their names? Would they be comfortable borrowing a cup of sugar, a piece of equipment, asking for help? And then we're going to map that along with their uh, climate risk maps to try and see where do you have uh, a climate risk that you've already identified, but as well as a social connectedness challenge to touch on that isolation piece. So I just wanted to show that there's progress being made on different um, facets of the climate change adaptation uh, challenge, uh, and that really a robust effort needs obviously infrastructure solutions to prevent or, or try to reduce uh, exposure to climate risks, but as well at the same time we need to think about the people and the social side of climate change. And what we at ICLE really talk about is um, 
applying a systems lens and thinking about the interconnectivity uh, that impacts an infrastructure impact, depending on who uh, it really affects, uh, is connected to a human impact or an economic impact and or a nature impact. And really all services and assets and people will be directly or indirectly affected by climate change. And I, uh, when we think about a community's vulnerability, we need to think about three elements. So exposure is the flood occurring where I live or where I work. Uh, sensitivity, am I already prone to harm uh, resulting? Uh, you know, my windows already leak, my roof is damaged. Um, and whether I have the capacity to adapt or the capacity to protect, and Don touched on this, right? Do I have the financial means? Uh, do I have the social network? Do I have the knowledge? to adapt. And I think that's another place where you as local authorities have a huge role to play in providing some of that capacity, providing some of that knowledge, providing some of that means to adapt through different incentives programs we're seeing. A few, uh, you know, I've, I've got about two or three minutes worth of content before we get into our activity, because what I'd love to do is hear from you. But a few guiding principles in that work is to balance immediate and long-term needs. A lot of the things we talk about are about hazards and one-off events that are happening. We already see them happening, but we also need to think about long-term and slow onset climate change, things like sea level rise, things like rising average temperatures, particularly as we're thinking about ecosystem impacts. We need to recognize existing work. Municipalities have been working on uh, what they may not have been calling adaptation for a very long time under the lens of emergency management, under the lens of stormwater management and asset management. So recognizing the value of that rather than seeing this as another thing that your municipalities now have to do. Um, and this last piece I wanted to talk about is co-production and collaboration. Increasingly, this is not something, um, I think people are starting to understand this, that this is not something that any one order of government or any one sector can solve. That it's really around this co-production and collaboration of not only plans and strategies to address climate impacts, but as well their implementation. The municipality isn't the holder of the pen. Um, it really is the facilitator of a conversation and potentially the connective tissue that ties all the local actors together who together have a role to play uh, in improving the resilience of that community. And then the last one I think uh, is an important piece is that interaction must be supplemented with action. We hear this all the time of, oh, I need more data. I need more numbers. And there, there's plenty of information out there. We, there are certain decisions for which you need highly granular data. There's plenty of decisions that municipalities make every day that the level of data that is now freely available through the federal government and the Canadian Center for Climate Services through the Prairie Climate Center and the Canadian Climate Atlas that can get people going on making decisions uh, to start adapting. Um, so really this, this interaction and this knowledge gathering mode that municipalities find themselves in needs to be supplemented with action to actually start reducing the risks. So we ask ourselves, why now? You know, there are a lot of challenges. There's competing priorities uh, for attention, for resources, both financial and staff. Um, there's a challenge with finding champions, people to be the voices of this. You know, in our small group this morning, we talked about the need for bold decision making. Well, bold decision making requires a bold decision maker to step out and make that decision. There's Managing uncertainty. The, we don't know exactly where the next flood will be. We have a sense of where there's going to be uh, big changes in the intensity and the duration and the frequency of precipitation, but they can't pinpoint exactly when or when that'll happen. And that is an uncertainty that has to be managed and requires a champion to stand behind the best available information and advocate for those decisions. And there's a certain element of translation, right? Translating scientific information with um, people's desi desire to change and behavior change. You know, Andrea said or this morning, hey, don't show a chart in an, in an emotional gunfight. Um, and this is where science and logic doesn't always translate to the way we make decisions. You know, we perceive climate change as something happening somewhere else to someone else. Um, not necessarily that could happen to us. And I think a lot of the images that we've seen showed that that's not necessarily the case. There's also a lot of opportunities as to why um, taking action on adaptation resilience is, I won't say easier, but less hard now than it was 
five or 10 years ago. You know, there's a growing network of organizations taking action in this space, of resources available, um, and uh, different models that can be taken depending on if you want to enter uh, the adaptation resilience uh, work through asset management, public health, uh, planning and zoning, depending on what entry point you want. There's plenty of organizations working on it through that entry point. There's more support from governments at all scales than there has been. Um, my organization started on adaptation in 2007 uh, under a conservative federal government, um, under the mayorship in Toronto of somebody who you may remember, Mayor Rob Ford. <laughs> Toronto got more work done on adaptation under Mayor Ford than it did on Mayor Miller. So, and I think this is one thing that is a benefit in the adaptation uh, toolbox over the mitigation toolbox. It's a it's risk management, it's a risk avoidance, it's uh, insurance. And so you don't need to use the climate change language if that doesn't resonate in your community or for you as a political issue. Um, there's the national adaptation strategy that just came out. Billions, not enough, dollars will flow from that adaptation strategy towards adaptation and resilience. Um, We'll see that come out in next year's budgets, what that looks like. But I think there's more opportunities for investment into this work uh, and more partnerships, such as the work that uh, Don had described, um, that can create enabling conditions in your communities to take action. And that's what I want to talk about in the activity in the afternoon. Um, I've been asked by Alex to remind the folks who are online to not disconnect, uh, but to stay online. I think we're going to take a how long break? 10 minutes, uh, firm stop 10 minutes. So at 2.32, um, I'll ask you folks to come back in here and we're gonna break off into really small groups um, to have a bunch of conversations around uh, your thoughts on how we can advance adaptation action locally. That's okay. <laughs> Perhaps still no Alex, but... It's all right. I think we just wait for a minute and the there will be the people coming up to just finish this off right now. Yeah, oh, yeah there you go. Oh, Alive. All right. All right. I'm going to ask anyone who's in the room to maybe just uh, sit down. And if you're not sitting down, just uh, just maybe pause the conversation for a moment. This is the end of the day. And I thank all, everyone for working with the occasional uh, time overruns. I know it's a little bit later than we'd expect to be wrapping up, but thank you. So I want to take a moment to thank everyone who was part of today, um, Andrea Reimer and Don Iveson for their keynotes, CEA. Let's give it a round of applause. ICLEI and the Community Energy Association for running these two fantastic uh, workshop activities. And I'm going to give a quick rundown for our sponsors, and we genuinely appreciate it. It's not easy to put these things on, and their support has really made a difference. So the Sustainable Solutions Group, uh, I'll just go through the bunch, and you can applaud like Matt at the end. Lidstone & Company, the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia, MFA, the Municipal Finance Authority, QP, WCS, Engagement and Planning, BC Municipal Climate Leadership Council, Community Energy Association, the Cooperators, um and uh and icly so uh we get a big round of applause for everyone for making this possible and just before we completely wrap this up i just wanted to uh, give a shout out to people who are online there are a couple of members of climate caucus of our staff our core team who aren't here today and who without whom this just simply wouldn't be possible and i'm thinking here of judy olivia and Emily, and I'm going to ask everyone to give them a huge round of applause. Thank you. And with that, thank you all for being here, either in person or virtually, and uh, we'll see you next year. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It was wonderful. <laughs>